cancels off and becomes a 1. Do you see that? Because anything to the power of 0 is 1. And so y to the 6 is the same as saying y equals 6 x to the 0. And x to the 0 is an exponent of a whole number, is it not? So that's why it is a polynomial. In grade 10, we did linear functions. y equals 3x plus 6, let's say. Well, every term has to have an exponent that is a whole number in order for it to be polynomial, okay? So how could we write it so that every term had an exponent that is a whole number? So y equals 3x. What is that? x to the what if it doesn't have an exponent? If this doesn't have an exponent, it's x to the what? Yeah, 1. So that's a whole number. And then plus 6, what will we write it as? x to the what? If it doesn't have an x, what is it? x to the 0. So do both of these have whole number exponents? Yes. And both of them are, that would mean that that's why linear is a polynomial. Okay? Last year, it doesn't matter what class you were in, you learned about quadratics. So this is degree one linear. Quadratics are degree two. And they're in the form y equals like 3x squared plus 2x minus 6, let's say. Well, is that a polynomial? Can I make all of them have whole number exponents? I would have y equals 3x squared plus 2x, which would just be to the 1, minus 6 would be x to the 0. So that follows whole numbers. 0, 1, and 2 are my exponents, right? The only one, other one we're going to talk about this year is cubics, and that's as far as I can go. If I asked you anything about a quartic or a quintic, which is degree 4, degree 5, I can't. The, your curriculum states that the highest I can go to is cubic. Um, 30-1 can go to quintic, so they can do degree 4 and degree 5. I can have to stop at degree 3. Okay, so if I gave you anything higher than that, you'd say I'm not answering it, and you could very well tell me that because it's outside your scope of your curriculum. So cubic is degree 3, and that would be like y equals negative 2x cubed plus 4x squared plus 6x plus 1. Could all of those be written to whole number exponents? This one's a 3, this one's a 2, that would be a 1, and this would be a 0, right? So it would work. What's not a polynomial? Let's give some examples of not a polynomial, which most of this goes back to grade 10. So if I give you like y equals 3 plus 1 over x, let's say, some people might say, well, that's x to the 1. It's totally fine. x to the 1. Completely okay. But it's in the denominator, isn't it? How can I write it in the numerator? How can you move a variable from your denominator to your numerator? Hmm? What do you do? Moving your, your variable from your numerator to denominator, what happens to your exponent? It changes to what? A negative. So this is the same as y equals 3 plus 1x, and instead of it being a positive 1, it's actually a negative 1. If you want to move something from a denominator to a numerator, you have to negate the exponent. So if it's negative, it'll become positive, but in this case it's positive, so it becomes negative. Is negative 1 a whole number? Is negative 1 a whole number? No, it's an integer. So that's why that's not a polynomial. Another one that's not a polynomial is like 2 root x plus 6. Does anyone remember how you change a square root to a variable with an exponent? So if I go over here and I say square root of x, this would be x to the 1, we agree. What's my index? A little number above this when this is a square root. What is the number of the index, the little number here? It's a 2, right? If it's anything but a 2, it has to be written. So when it's a 2, it's just not written. That's just terrible looking. 
So it's like this. Right? In grade 10, you were taught you can make rational exponents. Which I'm giving it away because the exponent is going to be rational, not whole. But how you do that is you write this as x to a fraction exponent. Well, how do I get my fraction exponent? Well, this number stays at the top and the 2 drops underneath. So I'm going to get a half. That's x to the half. So this is the same as saying y equals 2 x to the half plus 6. Is half a whole number? No, it's a rational number. That's why you were taught to go from a radical to a rational exponent in grade 10, and you were taught to go from a rational exponent to a radical. Vice versa. All you did was take the 2 and drop it in front, or take the 2 and drop it underneath. That's all you did the whole time. Thought it was really, really hard, but that's all you were doing. It's pretty, it's a cube root. You take the 3, put it underneath the exponent, and take the 3, drop it in front of the index. That's it. Mind blowing lesson in grade 10, though. People are just like, now in grade 5, you'd be like, okay, can I do that for a day? It's like brain shift for sure. Things get easier. Last one. What if I give you y equals 2 to the x? Is my exponent a whole number? Is my exponent even a number? My exponent's a variable, so it for sure is not going to be a polynomial. This is called exponential, which is the unit you go to next. So, constant function. I put polynomials and rationals together because if someone tries in polynomials, oh. Uh, You were on it. Okay, agreed to disagree. Okay, yeah, fine. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, constant function. Is y equals what? What was the constant function we did above? y equals 6, or y equals 5, or y equals negative 4, or y equals whatever. So we could do like y equals negative 2. That would be a constant function. A constant function is when the function only contains a constant. A constant is a number without a variable. A constant is a number without a variable. And this one does. Now constants make horizontal lines. Now often constants are not brought up in polynomials that often. But sometimes there are like an option in a multiple choice, like which of the following equations are polynomial, or sorry, which of the following equations are not a polynomial, and people will pick this one not as a polynomial, but it actually is, because you can raise this x to the zero. So constant functions are polynomials. Don't fall into an error of that. Now y equals negative 2 just means every y equals negative 2 exists. So this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. So that's why y equals negative 2 is just a horizontal line through y equals negative 2. Now you have to label it, because if not, which one of these is the x-axis, right? So I always label the equation. That's literally all we're talking about constants. We're going to flip over. So we're going to look at degree 1 functions. We're looking at odd degree functions. Odd degree functions are degree 1 and degree 3, degree 5, 7, 9, a whole bunch more, but we have to max out at 3 and we min out at degree 1, right? So we have two odd degree functions we look at, degree 1 and degree, oh no, purgatory. <laughs> I feel like it's like walking up. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so we have degree 1. Where we have y equals ax plus b. Okay? It's a linear function. We learned about that in grade 10. And it's degree 1. This is what one of the big things in grade 10 was. It's a degree 1 because my largest exponent is a 1. So it's a degree 1. 
Now, in grade 10, instead of saying ax plus b, which we use ax plus b and ax squared plus bx plus c and ax cubed plus b, we start with a's in grade 12, we just do. In grade 10, what did we write that as? Instead of ax plus b, we wrote it as y equals mx plus b. Exactly. So in grade 10, we talked about it as y equals mx plus b. It doesn't really matter if it's an a or an m, but we'll use a's all the time, so that's why we just use a. Do you remember what the m was of the, of the equation? The slope. Your m is your slope, right? So it's going to tell you if it's going up to the right, if it's a positive slope, or down to the right if it's a negative slope, right? Remember, negative slopes went downwards to the right and positive slopes went upwards. So what this is actually is this is called your leading coefficient. That's what we're going to call this. This is called the leading coefficient. We called it the slope, but slope only works for linear equations. But for degree 2 and degree 3, that first number in front of your largest exponent is your leading coefficient, and it will always be your leading coefficient. So we're not going to call it slope, we're going to call it the leading coefficient. Does anyone remember what the B is? B is your y-intercept. Now, whenever you are in standard form, so what does that mean? That means without brackets, your B is always your y-intercept. What should you always think when you hear y-intercept? Constant. What else should you think when you hear y-intercept? should be embedded into your soul. X. X equals zero. So anyone who's had me before, most often will have it embedded even if I just bring up X because I drill it into your head. If you hear y-intercept, you should immediately think X equals zero. Because then you can always find the y-intercept by just plugging 0 in for x. If you want the x-intercept, what should you always think? y equals 0. Because in order to be on the y-axis, x has to equal 0. In order to be on the x-axis, y has to equal 0. So if this is the y-intercept, why would it be the y-intercept? Well, if I was looking for the y-intercept, I would set x equal to 0, wouldn't I? What's a times 0? Zero? 0. It goes away. So the only thing that's left is b. So that's why b is your y-intercept. That's why the uh, constant is always your y-intercept. So the other thing to know is the constant is always the y-intercept. And that only happens when there's not brackets. You see how there's no brackets in that equation? It's in standard form. That's when the constant is the y-intercept. Because when you plug 0 in for x, everything else goes away. So I want you to all go to your calculators. Now I'm going to type it into my calculator on here and it scares me when I do that because it causes people to not keep typing into theirs. You have to be like calendar or calculator aficionados by the end of this unit. You will use your calculators constantly. You need to use your calculators constantly. So I want you to type in y equals negative 2x plus 4. Now, it always blows my mind when people don't know any of the buttons on their calculator. So I'm going, I always have to assume that no one knows anything. So you go to your Y equals, you have to press the Y equals button. It doesn't go in your main screen. And then you go negative 2, X T theta N button. This one gets you X plus 4. Okay? And then every time, what's up? Yep. Every time... I get people to press zoom, six, if you don't know what your window is set to. Once you've pressed it once, you're usually pretty good. But if you go zoom, six, let's go back there. Zoom, six is the standard window. So when you press zoom, six, it'll set your window back to negative 10, 10, negative 10, 10. So if your window has been adjusted to something wonky, zoom, six sets it right back so you don't have to set it back for it. If you have Zoom 6 set, if you have your window set, you don't have to press Zoom 6 every time. You can just press graph and it will graph it for you. Now, some people say, well, if I get two points, two points is enough to draw a line. It sure is. Maybe draw a really ugly line too. 
So what you want to do is you want to draw the most accurate line you can. If your line looks like you were riding a bus and drove over three um, speed bumps while trying to draw the graph, you are not getting marks. Okay? If you're supposed to be drawing a straight line and it looks like you like someone hit you in the back while you were drawing it, not going to work. Okay? And I say this every time, and then still on the test, have to circle and be like, you look like you were riding on a bus over like a rocky road or something like that. Okay? So everyone's taking this in. Great thing, if you have your calculator and it still has the lid, that lid can be taken off and used as a straight edge. It's a crazy thing. Look, multitasking on your calculator. If you lay this down on your page, you can draw a beautifully straight line. Okay? Now, on your calculator, also mind blowing people don't know this, but some people don't. Every year I find out. And I think they just forget. But if you press second graph, it will give you the table of values. Or it'll just go away. This board is awesome. Second graph gives you a table of values. You can arrow up and down and the, and the table of values goes up and down. Now I'm going to forewarn you, some people will hold the table to see how long it takes till it doesn't show you anything anymore. It will continually show you something. Don't take that as a challenge. There's going to be people who are going to hold the up and down buttons. I will not teach you how to get back to zero really quickly, so you're going to have to hold it equally the same amount to get it back to zero. Okay? It will stay where it is. So if you're holding down the button, stop yourself because you're going to stop listening to me after this. So there's always someone who's going to still try it. That's on you. Okay. This here gives you points. Gives you coordinates. So there's a whole bunch of these that can fit in the 10-10 window, isn't there? There's negative 3, 10, negative 2, 8, negative 1, 6, 0, 4, 1, 2, 2, 0. So people are like, do I have to plot them all? Yeah, plot them all. Because then you have a whole bunch of points and how much more straight is your graph going to be, right? It's going to be really well drawn. So we're going to go quickly sketch our graph using the, our table of values. So is this going to be the prettiest graph you've ever seen? Am I using graphing paper? No. So probably not the prettiest graph you've ever seen. But on a test, you'll be given graph paper, right? So it should be very well done. So everyone should be sketching. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay. So when you go to your table of values, Your first one is at negative 3 and 10, correct? So I'm going to go to negative 3 and up to 10, and I'm going to put a dot. And I'm going to go to my next one, which is negative 2 and 8. Then I'm going to go to my next one, negative 1 and 6. Then my next one is 0 and 4. Then my next is 1 and 2, 2 and 0, 3 and negative 2, 4 and negative 4, 6 and 5 and negative 6, 6 and negative 8, 7 and negative 10. Now, I am not going to draw a perfectly straight line because I don't have the lid of my calculator. So to me, those dots should be perfect and that line should be going through all the dots. So my graph is not perfection, even though the line is pretty darn straight. Alex, purgatory. All right. Yeah. Happens to the best of us. Okay, so we have an equation in front of us. Do you see how I plotted all those points? Do you see all the points? Do we see how I didn't just plot two and try and make a straight line through it? You also see that I have arrows at the end of mine. 
Is there arrows? You should have arrows because your graph is going on. So you try and draw the largest graph that you can in that area. And if your line is not straight because you freehanded it, but you have a lid on your calculator, I don't know why. Use the lid, make your line straight. So let's talk about the leading coefficient of this one. What is the leading coefficient on this equation? Someone whispered it. Cam was right. I think someone said negative 2. Negative 2 is the leading coefficient. The leading coefficient is the number in front of the variable with the largest exponent. So negative 2 is the one in front of x to the 1. The other one, does it, it would be x to the 0, so it's not the leading coefficient. So I'm going to put negative 2 and I'm going to put it in a box so that it actually looks like negative 2. If not, it looks like minus and minus 2 because I used the dash instead of like a colon, which I probably should have done. What's my y-intercept at? Now, a lot of people, and by a lot, I mean I bet you every single person in this class would say 4. Would, if you said the y-intercept is 4, what are you assuming? The person knows you have to draw it on the what? On the y-axis. Are you not assuming that? What happens when you assume? Things go bad. So, we are, do not want to say the y-intercept is 4, because it's not 4. The y-intercept is a coordinate. What is the coordinate that is the y-intercept? It's 0 and 4. Then I'm not assuming anything. I'm literally telling you it's 0 and 4. And kids in, in elementary school get taught how to plot on a Cartesian plane. They could plot 0 and, and 4 very easily. But if you tell them they have a y-intercept of 4, they have to have knowledge, right? It's not a y-intercept of 4. It's a y-intercept of 0, 4. And I can go plot it. No assumptions made. Next one. Do you see this? So this one says y-intercept. Do you see that? I did these both differently to prove a point because these are done terribly on the test. y-intercept is not asking for the number of y-intercepts. It's asking for what the y-intercept is, correct? 0, 4. What is this one asking me for? The number of x-intercepts. How many x-intercepts are there? One. People will tell me it's 2, 0. Did I ask what the x-intercept is? Or worst case scenario, I'll say number of x-intercepts and people will say 2. And they know blatantly well there's 1 there, but they say 2 because they're giving the answer to the x-intercept, not, not in a coordinate. Right? So if I say number of x-intercepts, it's 1. If I say x-intercept, you'll say 2, 0 in a coordinate. Do you see the difference? It gets done terribly on a test all the time. Now, this graph discos. If it does this, if the graph discos on for life, these should be your most happy moments. Because the domain and range are really easy if your graph is discoing. Because to the right and left, which is domain, domain is x's. What x value doesn't exist when it's discoing, whether it's a steep disco or not steep disco? What x's don't exist? Trick question. They all exist. The x's go from 0 all the way to positive or to negative infinity and 0 all the way to positive infinity, correct? So all the x's exist. How do we represent that? In a specific way, and if you do not do it in this specific way, you will not get marks. Because everything in math means something, just like every word in, in English means something. So if you wrote a sentence and you were missing some things in the sentence, like you were said, I went to school, and you wrote, I to school. Is your teacher going to be happy with you, I to school, in your diploma? I don't even know why you're writing I to school, but maybe you are. Um, I went to school would be, yay, I get what you're doing. You're going to school. I to school. What, I to school what? What does that mean? That's the same as how math works. If you're missing pieces of how you write something, you're missing pieces of the sentence. It doesn't make sense. And so if you understand why you do something, you won't make as many mistakes. So you have to do a squiggly bracket. So you have to start off with a squiggly bracket. If your bracket looks like this, guys, that's squiggly. They'll accept that. They won't accept a straight line like this because that's not a straight line. But they understand the squiggle problems, okay? This curly brackets. They're called curly. I like calling them squiggly. 
So I do curly brackets. If you do this, that's a curly bracket. They'll accept it, I promise. This way, they'll accept it. It's a squiggly bracket. If you do this, that means equal to. If you do this, that means not equal to in math. And it's also not set notation, which is not allowed. So none of this, none of this nor this can happen. Can a really wonky squiggly bracket go? Yep, has to look like it's squiggly, has to look like it's curly. Does that make sense? Now the reason why is the curly brackets in the definition of math mean the set of. So if I draw a, squig a squiggly bracket and another squiggly bracket, two squiggly brackets back to back, like one, and then put some stuff in there, I mean the set of. Every single time, that means the set of, that's the definition, okay? Now domain is what variable, x or y? x. And if you forget, domain x. If I draw a line, there are no tails. Range and y, if I draw a line, both have tails. Stupidest way to remember something, but it works. So domain, if you draw it with the x, all above the line, range, and the y, both have little tails below the line. See, look at that. Domain x, range y, okay? So we do the squiggly brackets x. Straight up and down line. Does anyone know what the straight up and down line means? Such that. So it's quickly brackets. The set of x values, because x is the values we're using. What if in the what if in the question they used a t instead of an x? That would have to be a t. If it was like h of t, which you've seen before, doesn't matter what curriculum you've been in, you've been given like h of t, and it's been like a, someone throwing a football or hitting a golf ball, and it goes, you know what I mean? Those questions h of t, instead of h of x is h of t, then you would have to use t in there because t is the variable they're using for x. Does that make sense? Okay, so we have the set of x values such that x is an element of all the real numbers. So that means every number in the world exists, which it does. They're just going, right? Every x value exists. And then closing the bracket just means that it actually is the set of. The set of x values such that X is now in the reals. Everything means something. Now, if I'm discoing, if I'm discoing, what are my Y values doing? All the way up? All the way down? Am I connected in between? Do I have all the Y values in between? Yeah, I'm like this way. Boom, this way. Boom, that way. Every Y value exists. So when it discos, your domain is XER and your range is YER. So the set of y values such that y is now in the reals. And just like I said, if it was h of t, you would have to use t instead of x. If it was h of t equals, you'd have to use h of t instead of y. So you only use y when y is the variable for y. But if they didn't put something else in for y, if they go h of t, h of t looks like this if you don't remember. h of t equals, and then they would give you like a downwards something, negative 3t squared then this would be your y, and I would have to go h of t such that h of t is an element of the reals, because this is the variable. If you say y is an element of the reals, and they used h of t, great, y is an element of the reals, there isn't even a y in the question. Does that make sense? You have to use the variable that they use. They did not use this, so we don't have to worry about it. Okay. So does everyone understand that one? Now I want you to type this one in. y equals 2x plus 4. And I want you to graph it and answer the questions below. Graph it and answer the questions below. You have about two minutes.
Wow, this would be a really crappy mark for this graph. Just got a pair of it. So you guys might think, well, that's not too bad. That's actually terrible. My graph is terrible. It's not a straight line. There's a curve in it. You can blatantly see it. It's because I'm trying to draw a graph, first off, on a vertical surface, which is almost impossible to get a straight line. But secondly, I'm drawing a graph where, if you look at my ticks, are they all perfectly displaced from each other? No. If you're on a graph piece of paper with a graph paper, you're, you will do better, right? So what is your leading coefficient of this one? What is the number that leads this equation? Positive 2, right? Because my largest exponent is 1, and the number in front of it is a plus 2. I'm just putting it in a box. Oh my gosh, that's terrible. Um, I'm just putting it in a box because of the dash that I left in. I should have used a semicolon. Do I need the positive sign? No, I'm just proving a point. Uh, what's my y-intercept at? Zero what? Zero four. Because my constant is my y-intercept, my constant is four, and my constant is four. So that's why both of these are zero four. You see that? I made sure to take the y-intercept after the same. So this is zero four. Number of x-intercepts. How many times does this cross the x-axis? Once. How many times does a linear function cross the x-axis? Once. Can it ever not cross? If you're disk going, you're going to have to cross somewhere, right? Because you're going all the way up, all the way down. Can you cross more than once? Can a line curve in a linear? No, the only way it could cross more than once is if it curved. If it curved, you drew it really badly. I don't know what you did. You had to curve it back. But a quadratic can. We talked about quadratics last year. They can curve back, right? The domain, because these are disk going, is x e r y e r. Now what I want to draw your attention to is your leading coefficient tells you how it ends on the right. So if you look at this one, it has a negative leading coefficient. Do you see that? And it's ending what on the right? Down. Do you see that? This one has a positive leading coefficient. Do you see that? How is it ending on the right? Up. It was ending up on the right. So not only does your constant tell you your y-intercept, your leading coefficient tells you how it ends on the right. And I'm going to leave that as a little note. And we'll talk about that more tomorrow. If you did not finish your rational homework, tonight would be still a good time because you still have to be tested on it. Oh, over there. I just left. I finished it.